Several people in the last few years have been dissing me in the comments because I color code my bookshelves and apparently their masculinity just can't take it. Uh, my bookshelves are currently completely randomized, so hopefully that will be easier to take for them. Hi everybody, here's the book chemist once again. Uh, I'm in the middle of a move, quite a disruptive one, I'm in a state of complete flux. So in today's video, rather than give you the incomparable insight into a single book that you've come to know and love, I will just be talking very briefly about a few books that I've read recently uh, and that are worth recommending. The first one I'll mention is Sing and Buried Sing by Jasmine Ward. I can show you the book because it was a library copy. It's the easiest one to talk about because it's very simple. Read it, it's amazing, it's a masterpiece, it was fantastic. It's a great take on both uh, the road trip novel and the ghost story that innovates on both of these genres brilliantly. It is one of those novels that manages to take a very simple event, uh, a car trip throughout the southern United States, and manages to expand it into a truly epic story, into an epic tale, a quest. Uh, and in this way it manages to convey two things, uh, I believe. Uh, the first one is how much of a struggle, how difficult life seems when you're very young. The protagonist uh, is, a, is a young teenager who has to look after his sister during his car trip. His mom is not really paying attention to them. It, man it truly manages to convey how challenging this basic situation can be for him. Uh, how much is at stake, how much pressure is on his young uh, mind, on his young heart. And at the same time, how, uh, how difficult, how dangerous life can be in a place where the people around you, and especially the people around you who are supposed to protect you, like the police, instead see you as a threat, see you as something that has to be defused uh, quickly and violently. Another library book I can show you that I read recently is Teatro Grotesco by Thomas Ligotti, an author that has been recommended to me for years because of my H.P. Lovecraft obsession. Lovecraft is very much my favorite writer and I can see why uh, people were recommending Ligotti. Ligotti writes very much the same style of Lovecraft's cosmic horror, uh, where these tales of monster and intangible threats are very much steeped in a certain worldview a certain philosophical outlook on life. There is a story in here called Severini, a story of putridity and fungi and mold that I absolutely adored. It's very much the type of fiction uh, I truly uh, love. And of course the Red Tower uh, is awesome. It's an awesome allegory of uh, life and society and capitalism and the w Western civilization and can be read in so many ways, as can Ligotti's horror stories that focus on the corporate uh, and capitalist world. Uh, in this sense, it truly uh, transmits the, some of the most nightmarish aspects of contemporary uh, life and managed manage to make me look at them under a new uh, light. Overall, I liked the collection, although I must say that I was a bit fatigued uh, by the end of it. Reading Ligotti felt very much like reading my philosophy textbook when I was in high school. I liked the concept in, in there, I found them interesting and they were clearly very, very uh, valid and stimulating, but after a certain point they just started flowing way, uh, flying way above my head. Uh, and my eyes got a bit dazed. Because the theory behind these stories is quite heavy and quite complex, I think it's the kind of fiction that's b maybe best appreciated in smaller doses. Uh, I still look forward to reading more of Ligotti's collections, uh, especially his early fiction that I've been told is even uh, more directly inspired by Lovecraft. The, the connection between the two writers is even more visible in those earlier tales. What a Carve Up by Jonathan Coe is an old some hilarious novel about the perfidity, the viciousness and the evil of the media, the political class, uh, how these people, people in positions of power, can influence society for their own gain in the most ruthless and cruel ways possible. It was written in the early 90s at the end of the Thatcher era and really reels with the, the tiredness after such a, such a terrible decade for the UK. This is very much a, a UK-centric book, although the problems it deals with, the hypocrisy and uh, outright 
lying uh, in the media, uh, the ruthlessness of the food industry and the, the, the military industrial complex, lying politicians, they're not just UK problems, I'm, I'm sure. It's a novel with a very clear structure, there's a movie in here which plays a very important uh, role in the protagonist's life uh, and uh, the uh, events in the novel almost come to mirror the plot of that movie to the point where the two start collapsing. Uh, it feels very postmodern as a novel in that sense and this structure feels almost creaky at points but it's still a, a truly valuable, truly entertaining, really hilarious novel. Uh, I think its most valuable lesson, if you want, the, the thing that I found most impactful was how it shows that the number one how uh, the greed and thirst for power in these ruling classes is very much a form of madness it's almost a, a self-harmful uh, desire and at the same time how these people are able to exploit society are able to exploit people because they take advantage of certain feelings that if whether we want to or not are very much part of our own um, selves and are very much things that we should look for within ourselves and, and be aware that these impulses, these tensions, the tensions to be greedy, to be careless, to go for convenience uh, rather than, than righteousness are very much impulses that we should be aware of and, and keep an eye out for. There's a beautiful feeling that develops throughout the novel where it becomes clearer and clearer that the terrible flows that the wind shows this uh, uh, domineering uh, evil family at the heart of the book, the terrible flaws that each of them have can all be found in various degrees inside the protagonist himself. Insatiable by Daisy Buchanan is a truly honest and frank novel about some of the trappings, both mental and societal, that people in their um, uh, mid to late twenties can fall into when it comes to expectations about careers, about personal life, about what one should be doing with their lives, uh, so on and so forth. It's quite porny, as the cover suggests, uh, but the the places where the novel gets porniest, it's where it talks about Marx and Spencer Hummus, uh, about white company sheets and towels, uh, about um, pots from anthropology, and all these trappings of uh, upper middle class life that the protagonist finds herself uh, lusting after. I am fairly sure, 99% sure, that this is intended, that this irony is engineered inside the text, uh, and it's not uh, you know, something that's funny at the book's expense. And in this sense, considering that the irony is very much part of the text, it was quite a funny, uh, quite a funny read and quite, quite an insightful one too. As a book, it was maybe torn a little bit between being truly insightful and impactful and being a little bit superficial at times. Uh, and the plot, especially toward the end, falls into a fairly predictable pattern of uh, the magic was always inside you all along, uh, sort of uplifting uh, end note, a uh, final note for the, for the story even. Uh, that said, that there was uh, definitely lots to appreciate in here. And finally, Civilizations by Lauren Binet, uh, whose uh, seventh function of language I, I really liked a couple of years back, uh, was a, a really fun novel. Uh, it feels very much like the craziest game of Age of Empires 2 you're ever going to play. Uh, it tries to imagine what um, early modern European history, 16th century history in particular, would have looked like if the European invasion of the Americas, especially the Spanish invasion of the Americas, Americas had instead proceeded the opposite ways with the um, American civilizations coming to Europe. I like the novel very much, probably, if I have to be honest, more in its concepts and its ideas than in its actual execution. Uh, and it showed uh, a couple of very important uh, points to me, it highlighted these points to me, uh, how easily history can be altered, how, how easily the history we've come to learn and to accept as inevitable could have been shaped differently by a few key events, and how certain reforms, certain innovations in history that, we, again, we now take for, for granted and maybe take for granted as positive innovations, good things that came out of history, had at their origin quite a lot of suffering, quite a lot of pain and quite a lot of death that often 
uh, get forgotten. Finally, I almost forgotten Bring Up the Bodies by Hilary Mantle. I was really surprised by how disappointed I actually was by Bring Up the Bodies. I really liked Wolf Hall uh, early uh, this year, last winter. Uh, I filmed a review about it, I was quite enthusiastic. Bring Up the Bodies just felt like it was a watered down I almost want to say dumped down version of the same novel, just carrying on the story but without much of the technical, stylistic originality that made Wolf Hall so interesting. A very clear, possibly petty example would be the way the novel is narrated. Wolf Hall is written in the third person, with the narrator using the pronoun he all the time, uh, usually to refer to Thomas Cromwell, who is rarely mentioned and again always referred to simply as he. And because Cromwell is uh, almost implicitly present in every scene. It's a little bit as if we are following this story, following these scenes from just above Thomas Cromwell's shoulder. It feels like we are half inside his mind and half outside of it following the, um, the events from this very intriguing middle position. Uh, that is gone from um, Bring up the bodies, whenever Cromwell is referred to, the narrator always specifies he, comma, Thomas Cromwell, almost as if to make the book more accessible, a bit less challenging, but to me, frankly, quite, uh, quite a lot less interesting. Uh, it simply felt like a fairly run-of-the-mill uh, historical novel. I'm still curious to finish the trilogy. The next book I'm gonna read is actually Station Eleven, uh, which was recommended to me by... Uh, well, it had been on my radar for quite a while, but I was quite scared of it. Lately, I've not really felt much like post-apocalyptic uh, fiction, but Edgar Refinetti, one of my patrons, recommended the book highly, and I decided to give it a try. Uh, after this, though, I will read The Mirror and the Light, uh, also by... Uh, Hilary Mantel, the end of the trilogy, and I'm curious, I'm hoping that it will redeem the trilogy in my eyes, because I, I really did like Wolf Hall. And by all means, hey, bodies, still entertaining, still tons of fun, still engrossing, just uh, falls quite short compared to its predecessor. Uh, so that's it. Uh, do let me know about uh, any of these books, any of these authors, what your thoughts are, whether you like these books, whether you recommend other books by these same authors. Uh, speaking of Hilary Mantel, um, I've been, in the last few years, I've been reading a lot about the French Revolution. It's a subject that fascinates me quite a lot. And I think I will read A Place of Greater Safety, her novel about some of the protagonists of the uh, French Revolutionary era. So I'm very curious about that one too. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for watching this video. As a bit of a, a favor, a big thank you to my patrons. I'm actually, for the first time, gonna make this video available to my patrons a few days, maybe a week uh, ahead than the rest uh, of the channel. Thank you so much, as always, to my patrons for supporting the YouTube channel. That's amazing. Uh, and thank you, everybody, wherever you are, whoever you are, for watching uh, this video and my videos in general. Have a great rest of your day and enjoy some nice books. Bye, everybody.